Welcome to Mind the Gap. This is the Mind the Gap Directors Forum, and we're beginning with a keynote conversation with Kathy Schulman. So Kathy is an award-winning producer, and I kind of think I may see an Oscar in the background of her Zoom room. So we may go there. Um, but she's a renowned and well-respected film executive. But more than that, I think that her work really reflects a commitment to values that we all share and care about. She's the co-founder of Reframe. Uh, she's the president emerita of Women in Film. And she's the president and CEO of Well Entertainment, who are doing some really amazing work. I have to say, Kathy, I'm really looking forward to First Ladies, which you're producing and writing. And, uh, you know, Viola Davis as Michelle Obama is like dream casting. Okay. So um, very, very much looking forward to that. So, and welcome to the Mill Valley Film Festival and to Mind the Gap. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be part of Mind the Gap and the film festival, even if we are in a virtual Zoom year and pardon my uh, office appearance as it is about to undergo some uh, renovations. But um, yes, that was an Oscar in the corner. We just brought him for, as a, for a friendly visit for uh, today's interview. Yes, 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 indeed. So... This has been a year kind of like no other. Certainly, I don't think any of us has experienced anything like this. And it's as though everything has been kind of accelerated and the learning curve, certainly in my world, in the festival world, as it has been across every industry, but it's been huge. So over the last months, you know, we've been on this kind of long path of reinvention and reimagining and researching, setting up online platforms and you know, nonstop Zoom rooms, pretty much. And of course, it's been the same for filmmakers and studios and sales agents and production and absolutely everything in the industry. And I think a part of it that we've discovered as we've tried to, you know, unroll this festival is that everything is interconnected. And every time we think that we've anticipated something, a whole new set of circumstances arise that we have to deal with. So... You work across several different parts of the film world. You're a producer, you're a writer, you've done Reframe, Women in Film. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you've encountered in infrastructure, in technology, in ways that you organize things as you've navigated 2020 that will change the way that you work now or might change the way that you work in the future. Yeah, it's been such a challenging year. And, you know, like all of these chaotic times, I do think it's true that opportunity does rise out of chaos. And I think there have been some very good learning parts of this experience, and there have been some rather traumatic ones. I mean, I think first and foremost, and, and, and the sort of top of my good list is that, you know, it, it's, it's caused many of us, and, and specifically me, to have a shift in priorities. And, and what that really means is to stop, look, and listen, to breathe for a minute. There is no question that the way that Hollywood is normally run is beyond frantic and hyperkinetic. And I, I see that with the slowing down that's been caused, you know, that's, that's been caused by having to stay in our own spaces, I'm seeing an increase in the quality of the work and the conscientiousness of the work. And, you know, for me, it's been a relief not to be in my car for six out of every 12 hours, navigating gates at studios and networks and having my car checked 13 times and going through various different, you know, security gates and waiting for people to be late and all the usual things that, you know, take place. So that's been a positive. I also, I also think that our time management is better as a result. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many cultural habits that I think were negative. Think of the shuffling around a room, who gets the priority seat, the shuffling around as to who gets to speak first, all of this sort of who goes to, you know, who goes to what and who has the most power. And in a world where everybody's equalized by a Zoom screen, one of the great benefits is that voices are being heard and some of these hierarchies are breaking down. And for my work, which is always, you know, dealing with diverse people and, you know, 
anybody and any kind of content that isn't the white male norm. These are all positives. Imagine, you know, suddenly all of these meetings without there being this shuffle as to who's, you know, the most important person that gets to fill the room with the most bloviation. So it's, you know, along the lines of what we saw in last night's, um, you know, debates. So I see those as positives. And, and, and obviously, you know, it's less overhead. I mean, we're spending less money on, you know, not being in an office and not spending so much time eating and drinking and doing these things. You know, that's a benefit too. Less overhead means more goes on screen. However, <laughs> there's some big negatives too, you know, among them, I, I, I feel like that we've got no social timeouts. It's all work, all day, constantly. There's no meal, there are no, again, now there's no meals. Now there's no running into somebody casually. There's no casual networking. There's no chance meeting or chance happening that happens. And so everything is super, super, you know, intentional all the time. And that's exhausting. Um, you know, there has been, uh, you know, look at you, you're involved with the film festival. I mean, it's no fun if you ask me to have to attend film festivals, you know, by Zoom when the best part of it, you know, was to be able to see your colleagues on the street and to have, you know, word of mouth flying around about that next film to see. And I worry, you know, about emerging voices in this kind of an environment, you know, for, for the truth is that the selling environment, whether it's happening at festivals or in the, within the business itself, or whether it's happening in the, you know, marketplaces, you know, at the high levels, it's maintained itself. But that's because the loudest noise, the biggest talent, the most prestigious IP packages are still easy to see at a time when we're all stuck on Zoom. What I worry about more is new voices, emerging voices, things that need to percolate on the street and percolate in community. And I worry about that. So I hope that when we somehow get through all of this, that we, you know, find ourselves back in a situation where we can, um, you know, communicate with one another. You know, I think that theater going will change permanently. I, I really do. I am one of the people who believes that, you know, this has been sort of a final nail in the coffin that people will choose to, to, to consume content where it's convenient for them. That's a Great point. I mean, I think it's one of those things that is really on people's minds. And um, I spoke with somebody the other day who's, you know, a former executive who really does not want to let go of cinema, capital C. And yet we're seeing this emergence. And so do you think that online film releasing may emerge in tandem with theatrical and, um, you know, perhaps releasing theatrically and um, online will become the norm for feature films. I do. I think that all release patterns will merge once and for all now, mm. and that the windowing will come to an end. Now, you know, what's interesting about this is that I've never really been a big believer that people make their decisions to see things in a theater versus on a television screen, especially as streaming has emerged on the basis of availability. I think it's still about the kind of content you wanna see in different places. I don't think there'll ever be an end to wanting to see certain kinds of event films in a big group environment. But, and I think that we'll continue to make those choices to do that, but I don't think it's realistic that no matter how much that we push back on, you know, maintaining the traditional windows, I, I don't believe that that will alter people's desire to see things at home. And I too am a cinemaphile and I too, first of all, I'm old enough to prefer, you know, to prefer going to the cinema and it's been my great joy of my life. But I, if I'm speaking realistically, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense and it's not convenient for most people. And we were being trained in a different way now um, on a daily basis. And I think COVID pushed us into all of that faster than it ever would have transitioned. Yeah, it's interesting you say the word event as well, because I think that there's that thing where we will go out for an event and we may well stay home and you know stream at home for something that we just simply really wanna see or catch up with. But, um, I think the other thing that's really been happening this year, obviously, is Black Lives Matter and just sort of 
the revelation of systemic racism in the U US. And you kind of, you know, inferred a little bit earlier on, uh, you know, to refer to sort of, you know, some of the work that you're doing. Um, and it's really, it's sort of articulate it's sort of become articulated as something that's essential for us to address in the film industry as well as throughout society. So with Reframe, for instance, which you're a co-founder of, you've addressed gender inequity across the industry in ways that have been very sort of result-driven and proactive, and you've made alliances with people, you have ambassadors. So what are the ways, and, and also the Reframe stamp, which has, you know, really identified how people are bringing their films out into the world and who's getting hired. So what are the ways that you anticipate taking this experience further in the upcoming months or the upcoming years, perhaps? Well, let me take this back a little bit and, and try to, you know, answer this question in, in a number of different ways and, and in a couple of different organize my thoughts in a way that I think would make the most sense. I mean, first of all, going back for a minute to the issue of streaming, I think one of the great things that's happening with streaming is that it's increasing the opportunity for there to be more content. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, it's really a seller's market. We can sell more than we ever wanted to before. On the other hand, it's a buyer's market because they're paying less than ever before and they really don't need to maintain um, the salary levels or even the quotes that were happening before. And the reason I bring all this up, mm. you know, to enter into the conversation about diverse content is that we do have a significant increase and in desire happening in Hollywood to enable and to support diverse voices. And there's more opportunity than ever to actually be able to get these projects sold and made. And that's a huge benefit. Now, simultaneously, you know, the pipeline isn't really ready for this. And I'll get to that in a minute. So I want to try to answer your question. I do think we have, we have a ripe mar marketplace in terms of its appetite for diverse content. Um, and I think we can, we can get it made. Um, to answer your question about the responsibilities and the role that Hollywood needs to play, you know, at this time of ab absolute civil unrest and, and yeah. deservedly so, you know, I want to separate this into sort of two different silos because even though they're related, they're not the same. One is what can we do about hiring practices, right? which is very much what Reframe's about. Right. And the other is what can we do about encouraging and expanding, you know, voices and the types of content, diverse content that actually get made, the storytelling itself. So in bucket number one, which is sort of, you know, the hiring bucket, you know, this is a really long overdue reckoning in Hollywood. It, it's mind boggling how long it's taken to first and foremost, you know, make a difference as it regards gender. And, and secondly, to, to make change regarding everything intersectional with gender, gender race, class, ethnicity, sexual orientation. And this has been the focus of so much of my work. And, and I think that um, we, like I said, there's more opportunity than ever, but we in Hollywood who have suddenly woken up should have woken up a long time ago because now we don't have a proper pipeline. And what Reframe is designed to do is to essentially enable systemic change by focusing on three different sides of a, what I call a systemic change triangle. On the one hand, what are we doing to increase pipeline? On the other side of the triangle, how do we combat cultural biases? which has everything to do with the hiring processes. And at the base of it all is the issue of marketplace. You know, what are perceptions of the marketplace and who's actually buying content? So, you know, Reframe, as we continue to grow, Reframe has had an enormous success, you know, in terms of raising consciousness as it regards gender, as you mentioned yourself. And the Reframe stamp is our sort of marketplace tool to identify content where there has been a gender balance in the process of making this content, meaning you know, the hiring practices. So when you're talking about you know, what can we do as it regards the BLM and anti-racist movements, um, absolutely, Reframe itself needs to become more and more intersectional. It always has been. Um, it's a point system and the hiring of diverse people gives piece of content increased points. 
but we have so much further to go. And I think that, you know, it can be done. I think we can continue to grow not only Reframe and its stamp, but other, you know, related organizations and, and, and to work on work, you know, like I think all boats have to rise together. All of these issues have to be um, managed together and we have to start, we have to really work with our industry um, partners to educate the importance on all three sides of this triangle. You can't fix pipeline without fixing culture. You can't fix culture without fixing pipeline. You can't fix either of them without acknowledging the true marketplace and, and getting rid, rid of mythologies about the market, marketplace. Because as we sit here today, the fact is the majority marketplace is A, female and B, diverse. Over 70% of all content in film, television and over streaming platforms is bought by women and girls. That is a big majority. Yeah. Okay, and when we come into diversity, the numbers are higher and we continue to, I don't want to even announce any numbers tonight because we have new studies coming out, but it grows and it grows and it grows. And um, the, the key to making change in Hollywood is to understand, you know, the marketplace. So, as I said, bucket number one was, you know, it, you know, is all about the hiring. Bucket number two, what do we do about diverse content? You know, it's more complicated how do we measure content? What determines something is diverse content? Um, but there's intentionality, you know, and, and what I would recommend, you know, for all of us going forward is that, you know, first of all, we can encourage stories that elevate people of color, most importantly. Simple as that. Either you elevate or you don't. You know, two, you know, I think that stories that unearth systemic racism, both in the past and in the present are enormously valuable. But again, even when we're dealing with diverse content, it, it goes back to the marketplace, you know, the demand, you know, the majority demand by women and diverse people. And, you know, our recent reframe study and, you know, to wrap up this answer here, you know, our most rec our recent reframe study, which was done alongside, you know, Annenberg, who've been our partners through many, many of our research, you know, right projects has really been an interesting one. We've been studying the effect of the marketplace and, and trying to answer, and we did, the question of, you know, do male-facing films, in fact, make more money than female-facing films? And secondarily, do white, facing, meaning films that feature white leads and co-leads make more money than those that don't? And, and the results were very, very clear. When all influences that affect the way a movie is made and released, like the production costs and the marketing costs and the distribution plan are leveled, our study discovered that absolutely not. Content featuring female leads and co-leads does not perform worse or better, in fact, equal to that with male leads and co-leads. Secondly, that films with leads and co-leads from underrepresented groups earned more revenue than those without. Meaning quite specifically that, and, and I'm, I'm literally going to read my, my studies report here because I think it's so crucially important to remember this, that, that this means that films with leading and co-leading characters from underrepresented racial and ethnic backgrounds are a significant and notable predictor of economic revenue domestically. This is a finding that to me cannot be ignored and it's consistent what, with what activists and advocates and artists have been saying all along, that stories with underrepresented leads and co-leads make money and that's period, they really, really do. Kathy, that uh, sounds like good news. Thank you for doing the study. Um, thank you for being with us today, and um, thank you for being a door opener and for doing the great work that you've been doing and connecting the dots between, you know, how you can work and the things that you care about. Well, you know, I think for all of us, it's, it's important that we put, you know, our money and our mouse and our feet and our dollars in the same direction. And, you know, what I'm trying to do is not only valuable for this cause, but it's completely lucrative and smart, which is, you know, to create content that both reflects our real world and delivers content to the actual people who are buying it. And I think that's the big game changer, right? And, and I think that's also the answer, 
you know, for emerging independent filmmakers. And as we sit here today, you know, on this eve of, you know, Mind the Gap, I mean, that is really the point, isn't it? That if we continue to use these tools and to understand the realities of our marketplace, we should be able to continue to plow ahead making original films. And one thing I know to be true, and I just wanted to say, you know, before closing, is that whether there's a theatrical marketplace that, you know, is open and healthy or whether there isn't, whether we're watching content, you know, by streaming or not, independent voices will always be that crocus that, you know, pokes its head through the snow of winter. There is never a way to sublimate originality and new voices and no systemic change as it regards release patterns and platforms can change that. And we just have to be smart on our feet and be agile. And as things change, remember that opportunity comes along with it. And that opportunity should be focused on the most diverse voices. Great. Kathy, that's wonderful. I really appreciate having you here. And um, we'll look forward to seeing uh, uh, First Ladies quite yeah, soon. Yeah, First Ladies, 10 episodes yeah. on Showtime about the American First Ladies. It'll be my yeah. next production. We start, we'll be COVID pioneers. We're headed on our way to Atlanta on January 19th to start oh, great. for a whole year. Oh, wow. So we'll see how it goes. And thank you for having me and good luck with the uh, program and with the festival. And um, it's been a pleasure to be part of it. Well, thank you again. Take good okay. care. Okay, bye Zoe, see you. Bye Kathy. Welcome to the Mind the Gap Directors Forum. I'm Zoe Elton, I'm Director of Programming for Mill Valley Film Festival, and I'm co-conspirator with Mind the Gap, Mill Valley Film Festival's Gender and Inclusion Initiative. So this forum is a part of a series of five Mind the Gap events and um, in this one, we're looking at 2020, the effect it's had on us and the film industry, um, whether we see any interesting changes that may come out of all this craziness. So we have this wonderful group of directors and they're all, they've all made fiction films that have come out this year or will be coming out soon. Um, they're all US based and uh, your films actually span uh, the launch times over this year. So I'm going to introduce you each chronologically by when your film came out. And what I'd like you just to tell us is where your film came out. Uh, so the person who was first this year was Radha Blank with the 40-year-old version. So Radha, you began where? Um, my film comes out today, actually. In oh, right. But you launched it at Sundance, right? At Sundance in January before 2020 turned into the beast that uh, it is. Um, and so we were all very, very optimistic. But it, I mean, it turned out to be a blessing because I got six screenings with uh, an audience. And um, we got acquired by Netflix and kind of came down the the hill running. And so here we are, uh, limited release. I'm encouraging people to check out the film if they feel safe. If not, you know, they can wait until October 9th to see it on the platform. So, great. yeah. Great, great. So you do have some theaters on board. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And then I think the person whose film came out next was Alice Wu with the half of it. Alice. Oh, right. Actually, you're right. I was about to just say we came out on Netflix, but we were supposed to launch at Tribeca, right. um, which obviously got uh, canceled. Um, and so we launched on May 1st on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, this is an aside, but this is incredibly embarrassing. And I probably should have read about this, but I didn't actually fully realize this was just for women filmmakers. It made total sense to me that this would be the panel. And only when you said that, I was like, Oh God, do I know any male film linkers anymore? So that's a little bit embarrassing because I'm like this, this I mean, I do, I think, but anyway, it was yeah. just only just hit me because it just seemed so organically right, I guess, this year. Well, so it, sorry. It, it is, well, I love that you say that actually, because I do feel that it's organically right because each of you has a film, yes, that launched over the span of the year, but as we go through and see what everyone's been doing, they're all very different and all, I think, are pretty extraordinary pieces of work that, yeah, span an amazing 
spectrum of, of approaches to the work. Um, so Alice, thank you. Tribeca was supposed to have been your launch. Um, and then Gina, your launch was in July, right? July 10th. Yeah, the... Um, with the old guard. Yeah, with the old guard. The original um, plan was to have both. We were gonna have theatrical and also launch on, on Netflix, um, which honestly was the reason why Originally, I was okay with Netflix. This was the first film I'd, I'd had on Netflix. And, you know, I don't think it's disparaging to Netflix to say that when I first started with this film, my hope was that it was gonna be theatrical. That's just what I'm used to. That's what I love. I love the bigness of film. I love the audience, the collective, you know, emotions and feelings. Um, but in retrospect, the fact that it's on Netflix and it had the the reach that Netflix does, 190 countries in one day is, is kind of mind blowing to me. So yeah. um, I, I think, you know, things happen for a reason. And um, I think we were lucky to be on Netflix. Yeah. So you would have done regular theatrical, but not necessarily a festival release, right? Correct. Yeah, Correct. okay, great. Um, and then Gia Coppola with Mainstream, where was your release going to be? Um, we, we were supposed to go to Telluride, but I guess we did the sort of online version and then we got to go to Venice and premiere it there at um, September 5th. It was very surreal to do that during a pandemic. But That's great. So I'm going to come back to some of this because I really want to hear what some of your experiences were, but I just wanted to have a moment just to sort of go through, go through each of you. And then Liesl Tommy, um, your film Respect is going to come out next year, I think. Um, it's going to come out January 15th, um, right. 2021. Martin Luther King weekend. It's great. It's great. Um, so I am interested in, I actually just, I'd love to sort of go back and I'd like really the rest, you know, after this, for us really to take this as a round table. You can, you know, you can unmute yourself and um, let's see where the discussion goes. But I'm interested, you know, for those of you who did not experience your film with an audience, Jeannie, you, you kind of, uh, you touched on this a little bit. Um, talk through what it was like to have to let go of seeing your film launch in a theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do feel fortunate in that we, we got into previews before COVID shut everything down. I think I would have felt cheated without that. So I did get to experience it with an audience and, and get to feel different moments in the film that I was very curious to see how an audience would react to. Um, certainly Joe and Nikki and, and that yeah. relationship in the film. Um, and uh, so I still hold out hope that I will get to have this in the theater at some point. Uh, I don't think anybody anticipated it going on this long and now it feels as if there's no end in sight uh, some days. So, uh, but again, the, the fact that we're in this social media age and that you can get this immediate feedback and immediate energy coming at you um, without having it in a theater, I think was kind of the saving grace. And I, I got to interact with fans and, and you know, kind of really um, see what they're feeling in the moment. And uh, so I appreciated that, certainly. Mm. Uh, and Rada, for you, I mean, Sundance, right? And it's your first feature. I mean, you have a lot of work under your belt, but here you are at Sundance, January, you know, who knew that a pandemic was on the horizon? What was the Sundance experience for you? Remind us of what it used to be like. <laughs> yeah, those many, many moons ago. Um, it was like it really that, right? Just feel like it was years ago, and it was just the top of the year. Um, it was exhilarating. I, I can't even lie. I've been to Sundance a number of times as a spectator, um, sometimes a semi-participant in that I was, uh, you know, kind of groomed in many of the labs uh, at Sundance. Mm -hmm. And so to be there with my own film, it was um, very surreal. Um, but but it was a great opportunity for me to learn what the film was. You know, I I clocked the audience a lot. I went to every single screening and the, the Salt Lake uh, 
screening, which tends to be more low key and, and less about industry was absolutely the best to, to have like people from the community um, kind of cheering the film on. Um, it was, it was a great experience. Um, looking back, they say that Sundance may have been the hub for this pandemic. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, um, but I was, I was. You're kinda, okay, right? I'm fine. I've been tested like four times because I'm kind of crazy. But, um, you know, there was a lot of drinking and celebration. And even up until the award ceremony, you know, I really was not expecting to win Best Director. I, I thought, if anything, the ensemble, we'd get an ensemble, you know, nod because I just am so proud of these actors. And so Dee Reese, mm -hmm. who's a good friend of mine, is up on the podium talking and I'm just like, oh, look at her. And I'm taking a swig and my drink and stuff. And so by the time she mentioned my name and I got up there, my speech was a little slurred because I just, <laughs> I just wasn't thinking. Um, but it was, it, was, it was wonderful to get that affirmation as a director um, in a place where, you know, over the last couple of years, like they were dedicated to kind of grooming my voice as a first time director. So right, right. it's been awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. And then, you know, the world kind of shut down. Nobody shoots a 35 millimeter black and white film, you know, with the pure intention to, to simply just show it on a, a, a digital platform. Um, just like Gina, I think part of the reason I bought into Netflix was not just that global audience, but they were like, this is a piece of cinema. We're gonna make sure you get some screenings at some art house cinema places around New York and the country. Um, but they've done like, you know, they really, rose to the occasion to make sure I still have that experience with um, an audience, you know, right. um, having some drive-in opportunities and um, like we said, a, a limited release. Um, it's, it's been pretty cool. I really do though feel for the filmmakers who, you know, were, were at Tribeca or South by Southwest and they were in competition about to make their debut and didn't get to have that experience with their live audience. Um, so I don't take for granted that I had those six screenings. They're like gold right. to me right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And actually, just you mentioned 35 millimeter. Just show of hands, how many of you have shot on 35? Not necessarily this, your current film, but yeah. Ow! Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Um, but Alice, of course, that was, you know, I, probably when you were expecting to be at Tribeca, those of us in the film festival world were thinking, is Tribeca going to happen? Is Cannes going to happen? And, uh, you know, we were really tracking that to see, you know, it, it was this intense time of seeing what was going on. So yeah. that has to have been a really rapid pivot for you. Yeah, um, mm. sort of two thoughts come to mind. <laughs> I mean, the first, just specifically around uh, Tribeca, like I echo a lot of what Rada and what Gina said about how, like I shot my first film on 35, like for me, theatrical, mm -hmm. like I, you know, I live two blocks from an Alamo theater. I probably go to the theater at least two to three times a week when I can. Um, but to be honest, because I had just come back from Taiwan in January. So I was like an early, like the, the coronavirus is something that I was er, like starting to freak out about my mom, who's elderly and high risk. And my mom was like hell bent on going to Tribeca and I was hell bent on her not going to Tribeca. And we're literally daily having this massive argument on it about it. So weirdly, when it did get shut down, there was like a weird kind of relief, like where I was like, at least I'm not, because honestly, I knew I was going to lose that fight with my mom. And then I was going to spend the entire time paranoid that like she was going to catch the coronavirus. And so I guess in a weird way that that was sort of the saving grace where kind of like Rada said about like, oh, my, my film's coming out today. If you feel safe, go. Like, I think at the time I was just telling everyone. Well, so then the second thing is that the thing that surprised me is that Netflix actually called me up in January and said, the film turned out great. We're going to give you a theatrical release, like a specialty theatrical release. And I hadn't even thought to ask because I thought that's never going to happen for me. I'm not Martin Scorsese. So like the, so I was so excited about the idea of my friends and family seeing it on the big screen. But similarly, I think when the, you know, I, I think I was just so, uh, uh, like I just had this idea that maybe it was gonna be bad. Even at that point, I had no idea it was gonna be this bad. Like actually this is mm -hmm. like five orders of magnitude worse than I thought it was gonna be. Um, but ultimately, I, the other thing I guess I would say is that when I first was coming out with the script, 
um, I did actually have several financing possibilities. And one would have been a specialty distributor and one would have been private financing, which is what I'm used to, which happened in my first film where it's like we sold at Toronto and Sundance and then we, we, we went the sort of, you know, the theatrical route first. And then the third was Netflix. And I was personally, as a filmmaker, leaning toward the idea of, of going, you know, the route I'm used to. But because of the half of it, like that specific movie, um, I knew I didn't want to cast any stars. I knew I was casting fresh faces. Um, and the head of the Netflix division of that division took me out to dinner and was like, why did you write this? And I had started writing it after Trump had been elected. And so I specifically put it in like a small rural conservative town because I was trying to find some sort of understanding in my head as to, you know, like I didn't want to just be like, half the country is horrible. Like some part of me was like trying to maybe reconcile in, in my head. And so I said to her, like, you know, I guess I would love it if someone in, you know, a so-called red state actually watched this movie. And then I started do, following that logic and be like, that person is never going to the theater to see that movie. And they're definitely not going to a landmark theater to see this movie um, because there probably isn't even one in their town. But in the privacy of their own home, they might press play, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, how I made the decision is I was like, you know what, I have my best shot at reaching those folks um, on Netflix. And they turned out to be like an amazing creative partner. Like they really were like, we want you to make your film. Um, and then, yeah, the bonus is when they surprised me if like we want to do theatrical. Uh, but the other thing is I did luckily, they, they wanted to do uh, test screenings, which I'd never, my first film was so tiny. Our test screening was like invite all of your friends and see what they think. But so we had test screenings in Manhattan and then also in like a conservative suburb of Phoenix where there literally were MAGA hats in the audience. And it was fascinating for me to sit in these huge multiplex theaters and list, watch people watch the film. Um, and the thing that was fascinating for me is that, like I knew it would probably, you know, I knew it was gonna score well in Manhattan, but it actually even scored a couple points better in the conservative town, which shocked me. But we, we got the, we got the, um, the whatever, those, I, the, uh, the little questionnaires back. And I was shocked how many people were like, they're conservative. They actually marked the film excellent, but when asked if they'd recommend it to a friend, we're like, no, because I'm okay with this, but my friends would not be okay with this which you're, tells me- You're their secret, their secret like. Yeah, but that tells me then, thank God in this case, at this moment in time, we went with Netflix because they, those people would like watch it, you know, and like, and so, yeah. And since then I keep hearing from friends being like, my conservative uncles in Maine sent me, told me to watch this film. So yeah, that, that turned out to be a huge blessing. Um, and yeah. I think that sort of me counteracted you know, I miss the theatrical experience, but for this film, I'm really, really glad uh, it, it, it worked out. Yeah, and you bring up a lot of interesting points that, I, that we'll circle back to. And uh, uh, Gia, you ended up, you know, Telluride ended up not happening in Telluride, um, and you went to Venice. So you did you actually go? You actually got on a plane and went, and did you have friends and family with you, or...? Um, yeah, I mean, we found really, we found out really late in the game that uh, Telluride wasn't going to happen because they were they were really trying for yeah. a little while to to keep it going, um, and then and then we, we were trying to figure out how we could make Venice happen. And um, fortunately, I, I I am an Italian citizen, so I had that that privilege to get to go. But um, you know, we did a lot of uh, COVID precautions, quarantining and, and tests, and many, many tests. And, um, um, and, it, and it was just uh, a small group of the, the, the producers and, and Maya, the, Maya Hawk, the actress. Um, but it, it was really, um, as I said, it was super surreal to kind of share the film in that way. Um, of course, it's, it's sad to not like get to share it with all the people that were a part of making it and the crew and stuff to kind of really get to, you know, experience when there's laughter or things like that. But um, for everyone that like came out and kind of took, you know, wear that wore their masks in the theaters, it was like extra extra meaningful that people came out to kind of do that and share that experience um, all together and you know make that effort for cinema. Yeah, I mean, you must be probably the only one of us who's actually had a theatrical experience since COVID, I would imagine. I don't know if anyone else has. 
lives in a place where theatres are already open, but I know that I don't hear. Do, so were people, was it a full theatre or was it a percentage of the theatre or? Yeah, they did. Um, every theatre was 50% capacity mm -hmm. and then they, everyone was separated and like a few seats apart and stuff. So, yeah. but it, it, it does have that energy of like, you know, everyone was a little more quiet because they don't, you know, they're wearing masks and they're not trying to like, you know, open their mouths. But um, it, yeah, it was, it was definitely an, um, an experience to remember. Yeah. Uh, so Liesl, you've been making your film while all this has been going on. So did your production get halted or postponed or did you have everything in the can or how was that? Yeah, I wrapped the end of February. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it was a real gift that, um, that, that's, that we managed to finish. And then I took a week off and then uh, started um, post and about 10 days into post, everything got shut down. Um, wow. And, you know, I, we all retreated to our apartments and the, almost the entire edit I did in Harlem in my apartment. Um, I don't recommend editing your film that way, <laughs> um, especially, especially a music film, you know, where you just really need the vibe. You need to be around your people. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was quite a journey, but, um, you know, and I, I live near Harlem Hospital, so there was just like the never ending things, all the things all through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was intense. It was really intense, but every single day I got to look at those beautiful actors and listen to Jennifer Hudson sing and put the film together. And it was, you know, it became um, spiritual, you know, mm -hmm. the, the process. You know, and it, and all of you know, like there's a point in the editing process where you're, you're like, am I still working on this movie? Like, how much longer can I possibly do this? Um, and then that gets exacerbated by the crazy world we're living in. Um, the first time we did our temp mix, we actually, you know, did it um, all together in a big studio, and it was so emotional to be in the room with the sound editor and the music editor and the dialogue editor, um, you know, and my actual editor. Um, it was, it was profound, um, you know, and we just really, it was so fun and joyful to be actually working together in the room on mm -hmm. the film for that, um, for, for, for that moment. Um, you know, and it was the thing that I had been craving, which is to see when, they themselves got emotional or when they started, you know, moving to the music, that was the thing that I had been craving, you know. Um, and I'd done a few um, friends and family online Zoom previews <laughs> early on that I kind of just concocted together. I, we sent people pics cuts and then I made them all get on Zoom and then we were like, press play! And then everybody <laughs> press play together. Rada was one of those people um, who helped, you know, with the feedback early on. So you just had to get real creative. You know, there was a point where I said to the team, I was like, I don't, we cannot control Corona. We cannot control release dates. We cannot control anything. My middle name is Pivot. Um, but what I can control is the quality of this film. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we had our first preview, which was 300 Strangers basically over Zoom, um, which was, you know, crazy. And then this Wednesday, two days ago, we had a second preview in New Jersey at an AMC. Whoa, how was that? Amazing. Oh. And it was three theaters at about 25% capacity. And we had two focus groups afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it went very, very well. Um, and it was really great to see strangers um, watch it and, you know, even through their masks, talk back to the film and move, you know, to the music. And I could hear them crying. I could hear them laughing. It was so, I'm going to get emotional. It was so profound because we've been, you know, when you've been alone in a, in a room, you're like, is it all in my head or is it real? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I think that's the thing. You know, it's that first audience thing. Um, I would love it if any of you just would jump in on that. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, you just talked about that, Lisa, but in some of other, you know, Rada had an experience of a first audience. But how has that been for the rest of you? And is there anything that we're learning from this in terms of the way that we bring films out into the world? Well, I mean, as much as I, I don't know how all y'all feel, the, those first previews are so scary because, and I literally get physically ill. It's so hard for me to sit in there because I've just spent 10 weeks, you know, where it's just been mine. And, and my editor, uh, Terry Shropshire, who, you know, does everything. So, and now I have to give it to the world and be judged. And that is, uh, and also it is, I have my gut feeling about what I feel about the work and, but is it, you know, at least just said, is it all in my head or is this, you know, is this good? And so the, those first audience things, as scary as they are, it is, that's why we make film uh, as artists. We're, we're, we want to share with an audience and share with the world. So it's so essential to be able to do that um, and to get that feedback and just feel an audience, how they're responding, where they're laughing, where they're crying, where they're bored. Um, so to not be able to do that in the future would really suck. And I, I'm curious how it would feel over Zoom to, to do that. Because how can you truly feel an audience over in, you know, these group of boxes as opposed to sitting in the middle of a theater and feeling that? Yeah, anyone else want to uh, pick up on that? Um, no, I, I totally uh, agree with what Gina is saying. And I also... Uh, get extremely scared that first preview, um, partly because at that point, I, the film has in some ways lost its magic for me. Like I'm staring at it so closely. And so at that point, I'm thinking, I am not funny or profound or anything. <laughs> and so to hear like people respond with like for the first time with emotion um, is like, it, it helps you, or it helps me at least keep going on. Um, and then I guess the companion piece to this, and tell me if this is not what, what you're asking, is so I'm not a social media person, but Netflix pretty much made me one because that's apparently the, you know, a big part of their strategy to, to get the word out. Um, and so I had never done this thing called, um, I'm already going to mess it up. It's when you play the film, you live, you live tweet. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I'm 50 years old, so I'm kind of a grandma, but it was like this moment where it's like everyone had to teach me like how to do that. And I, I'll be totally honest, no, it does not feel the same to me as sitting in an audience with people. They will never feel the same to me, but I'm aware that in some ways um, that may not be true for someone who comes from another generation, right? Like I'm open to the idea that for someone who is from another generation, that might feel more connecting because they're used to the pathways of their mind and the way they connect. They can sort of split focus like that. Like I'm very much like, I'm, I must focus on this thing. I don't want any interruptions. I don't want to like, I fucking, oh, sorry. I freaking hate it when like the movie just ends and the person next to me turns to me and it's like, what did you think? I'm like, ah, I just want to be in here with the credits and I want to feel it. And, you know, but for new generations, I think they're very used to, they're watching and they're talking to like five different group chats and they're tweeting, right? Mm. And so there is a part of me that wonders, like I'm not sold on it. But I also saw, especially because the kind of stuff I make is so personal to like queer communities or Asian communities, I sort of watched all these people make connections with each other. Um, and also in a weird way, as I was live tweeting, like give me, like help me along with feedback on how my live tweeting was going, which was really um, sort of charming in its own way. So I, I guess that's the thing I would say is, is for me, it wouldn't feel as good, but I'm aware that maybe there's like a new, there, there's an, a, a new model in the future. Um, what I was just going to add um, is uh, I also had to edit portions of the film remotely. Mm -hmm. And so when it was time to start launching the film, um, you know, m most of the films on Netflix, there was like 
limited access to festivals, you know. Um, I think it was part of their response to COVID. But they 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 did support me in showing the film at Black Star Film Festival. The majority of the festival was virtual and there were three films, my film, um, Miss Juneteenth and Be Water that were part of a drive-in in Philly. And um, I have to say this was uh, uh, right before August. And so people were just chomping at the bit to do something socially and um, we were sold out and I couldn't hear people clapping, but they were honking their horns. <laughs> and so, you know, I was nervous because, you know, the cars were kind of, people were in the cars and the windows were up, so I couldn't tell if people were laughing or enjoying or Every once in a while, I guess someone had a car roof, you know, and I could hear them, a laugh coming through that. But, you know, because it was all that we had in the moment, I just, I ate it up, you know, and I, I do see that it's become successful for some films. I think there's a, um, one of the um, X-Men New Generation films was shown exclusively at drive-ins and they did very, very well. I, I, I hope I got that right. But um, I don't know. It feels like the the industry uh, platforms like Netflix and Amazon are doing what they can to kind of create the feeling of social engagement, which is something that is so important to me as a filmmaker. Like, you know, I'm not the best activist, but <laughs> I try to use the, the film as my form of, of activism and, and community engagement. And so it was really important that I did something. And so I think for our New York, no, no theaters are open in New York and it's kind of heartbreaking because it's a New York film, but mm -hmm. Netflix is supporting us and having a drive-in in Queens, you know? So I'm hoping that that becomes a model just so that in this crazy time, like, there is some kind of social engagement outside of this virtual world, which is which is cool, you know, and it does, I feel like the Black Star Film Festival probably reached a really large number this year because, you know, generally people go to Philly to, to watch the films and now all of these great films are available to people virtually. So I don't know, I feel like people are doing their best to rise to the occasion and um, the virtual world might mean a whole new audience for a first time filmmaker, you know? So I guess that's the, the beauty of the moment, you know? And how do we continue to move in that direction? Um, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, for us as a film festival, we had, you know, it's like by M March, we had some ideas. April, they were starting to become, you know, lists, you know, to-do lists and research. And we ended up doing like a ton of research on um, on platforms that we could stream films on. But the theater, the Rafale that you asked about, um, they turned, they got an online platform going within about two weeks. And I can tell you that if we'd had to do that in any other time, it would have taken weeks and months and probably years of meetings to try and figure out, well, what are we going to do? We got to research, but we had to do it, you know, in the moment, which was pretty amazing. And that was also kind of a revelation from, you know, the festival perspective, so that we knew that going down the road when we brought the festival out in October, that we could do online. And we knew that that would be safe, which was a big consideration, obviously, in a pandemic year. Um, for us in California, and especially in Northern California, safety goes hand in hand with fires as well right now. Um, so there's that. Um, but we also looked into to creating a drive-in, which we're doing, and we've taken over a space um, in San Rafael, you know, in a meadow. We'll be able to have 265 uh, cars. Um, and actually, Gia, your film is going to show at our drive-in, I'm happy to say. Um, but it's definitely, you know, new ways of showing films because I feel like there have been a lot of pop-up drive-ins. I mean, how many of you have been to a drive-in in the last few months? Just a show of hands. Anyone? Yeah, me too. I, I have not, but I'm in San Francisco. And can I get a ticket to Gia's drive-in to see Mainstream? Absolutely. <laughs> Palo Alto was the movie that made me feel slightly OK about shooting not on film. That's a separate <laughs> sidebar, I'll tell you. But I literally showed that to my DP and was like, and like read all about the process you went through with Autumn Durald. So sorry. Just Oh my God, there's a whole topic of discussion there that I would love us to get into sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll do that, Alice. Yeah. Um, so 
yeah, so we were shifting in film festival world, but the other part of it is kind of the flow of the year. You know, the year kind of starts with Sundance. In the middle of the year, you've got uh, you've got the Cannes Film Festival and a lot of the fall releases show at Cannes and then there's the fall releases and the you know Academy campaigns and all that kind of stuff. And the whole year has just been completely turned upside down. Um, and you, you guys are bringing up a lot of interesting things. So I just, as well as that upturning, there's also been the other really deep disruptions in 2020. Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. uh, political disruptions, cultural disruptions, the kind, you know, climate change. Um, so has any of those things, I, I feel like everything has been incredibly accelerated this year. So have any of those things shifted your priorities in terms of how you want to bring your current films out or what your priorities might be for films that you'll do in the future? Because each of you has a film that in some shape or form connects with, you know, a, a cultural pulse, let's say, uh, that I think is very important. Uh, well, I would say the, I mean, it, it's certainly, I have always had the mindset uh, in the fight to to make films that center black women um, and and also tell our stories authentically and truthfully and you know the hope is that one that I'm giving um, certainly my community an opportunity to see ourselves reflected when we are so often invisible in films um, but not only the chance for us to see it but the world to see our the breadth of our humanity um, so knowing how important that's always been, it's been so magnified and amplified in this moment. And that was one of the things that struck me about being on Netflix and having the old guard on Netflix. I mean, one of the main reasons I, I took it was the fact that there was a character, Niall, a young black woman who was a hero. And you can count on one hand how many times that's happened um, in Hollywood. And the fact that when I heard uh, that how well the movie was doing on the continent of Africa, that, that over 65% of homes that had Netflix had watched The Old Guard, that just, it blew me away because I knew that, that they got to see themselves reflected. Um, and uh, so as much as, uh, as much as I want 100% for theaters to come back, I think it's great that we could have both and that there are streaming platforms which give the world the opportunity to see um, my films and Alice's films and Rada's films and, and, and to, again, to see, to see Black women, Black people, people of color uh, reflected in an authentic and truthful way from our lens, not someone else's lens or, yeah. or stereotypes of, of who we are, but from our authentic lens. Yeah. I, it's, it just comes to you in a second. It's, it's really amazing that you say that. And I have to, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you've always done. And, and this would be for each of you as well. In some ways, I feel like the time is now and that we have to step up. White people have to step up. Um, and we have to step up in a lot of different ways. Um, and when, you know, Jeannie, you've been making work for a long time now. Um, when, I, when you can see that in this year, we have this amazing group of directors, and not hyphenate directors, this is not women directors, this is directors whose work is really just on the money for what we really need to see and hear and feel right now. It's uh, kudos to all of you. Um, but I was cutting you off there, Alice. Go for it. No, it's only because I, I, I mean, Gina already knows this, but I, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I've been looking up to her since early 2000s for her work, Love and Basketball. Like, just, and like, like filmmakers like her had such a profound effect on, you know, what I thought might be possible. And it only just occurred to me in the second 
that like I think I, I freaking love the old guard. I also hope I get to see it in the big screen. Um, and I guess I guess the thing I would say is this: like I've made two films that feature queer Asian, you know, uh, queer Asian immigrant women. So obviously I not I I'm you know my wheelhouse is pretty specific. Um, but I think that we're in such an interesting moment in time, uh, like as Gina and Zoe that, that you bring up, where what mattered to me about something like Black Lives Matter is it felt like all of a sudden there was this moment where finally people were just saying shit. Like they were just like, I don't care if I get fired, this is what I think, right? And I'm, I'm really here for that. Like I just feel like if there was something that was difficult for me about Hollywood the first time, like my first film came up 15 years ago and like a few years I was like working for hire in Hollywood and then I left to go take care of my mom. But if there's one thing I remembered thinking like, wow, what's really hard for me about it is I could never tell what anyone thought. Um, and I often felt like I'd be in these meetings where I'm like, I don't, I can't tell what's happening right now, right? And I feel like we're in a moment where I, I kind of love that people are speaking up, speaking their truth. And my hope is that it does change the industry um, such that it doesn't matter what ethnicity or cultural identity or, you know, that I, I want, I would rather someone, let's say if someone is white, I would rather they say to me, hey, I don't know if this is right. This is what I'm feeling. I just, like that they were just honest with me about something and then I could also be honest and, and say, well, here's what I feel. Because I think that gives us the best chance of actually making the best work. Um, so looping us around to the old guard, like and and what, like I, I know I have my own films. Like I don't know that I've changed. I have my, my own stuff that I want to work on and maybe I'll get lucky and get to make another film, right? Maybe I would do something that is, you know, like the first time around I realized like, oh, I didn't really love what Hollywood might be offering me. But if that were to happen this time, I think it would be because of something like Black Lives Matter or even like Time's Up that if there's a culture shift within Hollywood where candor becomes a value that people respect, like, mm -hmm. like not being an asshole, not, not like saying everything that comes to your brain just because you feel like it, but genuinely wanting to, to be real about what you feel. Um, then I think I'd be much more interested in working, doing something within Hollywood. And I thought the old guard, when I saw it for me, I think it resonated for me so much because it's, I mean, it's just on every level. It's a big movie. It's a great action movie, but it's like empathetic and there's nuance in it. Mm -hmm. And I felt Gina's imprint on the whole thing, even though it wasn't like, oh, this is just a thing she wrote and directed that was entirely her personal life story. Like I felt that and I was like, okay, someday if I could do that, then it becomes much more interesting to me. So I guess that would be the 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 what I feel about this moment. That's really interesting. So empathetic. What was what was the word that you used as well? If everything was sorry, it was nuanced. I mean, it was it was yeah. just stuff that like I feel like a lot of times I don't get in action films, and yeah. I like I watched this and I'm like, yes, this is a Gina Prince Blythewood film, and I felt her sensibility in it and it's an action film like it's a kick-ass action film right? right like you don't lose right. any of that and so i i love that that could happen now um i would love to believe it could have happened 15 years ago i bet it couldn't have is my guess yeah. <laughs> you know based at least in my experience in the industry or even like i once spoke to karen kusama and like her experience trying to get an action film made and I just feel like, you know, I, 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 I love that people like Gina are kicking down the doors and I, I think that she's proven something, right? Yeah. And then I think that makes a big difference for the rest of us. Yeah. And I would say, you know, similarly, um, Gia, with your film, you know, you've taken something where, I mean, it's just, it, it straddles this beautiful uh, line between uh, I mean, satire and comedy and insight, you know, into these characters that I think is just beautiful. Um, it, it also is very much a film of its time. Could you just talk a little bit about whether you think this is a moment uh, in, for you with your work? Do you think things will shift for you in the future? Or it, it feels, you know, again, like this is very much a film that is right for this moment. Um. I think it, it stemmed from just my fascination of how can you take this new kind of 
platform media, the internet and make it cinematic. Um, and I had fallen in love with that film, uh, Face in the Crowd, and, and it felt very relevant even though it was made in the 50s and um, that sort of our culture and its value and narcissism. And, and this was before Trump was elected. And so when that happened, it kind of opened the gates for a story like this. But, um, uh, but um, yeah, I just, I wanted to, to express what I was feeling in this sort of, you know, um, new medium and, and, and where does art lie and, you know, um, feelings and vulnerabilities and, um, but was, the more I got to know the film and kind of in the edit, I started to realize like, oh, this is, this is a, a, a more of a fairy tale of kind of what this was going on. And um, it kind of gave me liberty to break the rules cinematically. And, and I hope you can make it feel a little more timeless, even though it's dealing with more relevant. Issues. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has that definitely. And Liesl, for you too, I mean, you know, Aretha, you know, I mean, talk about timeless. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I can't wait for your film to come out. I feel like it has to be sort of like the anthem that brings us into 2021. I mean, do you feel like this is very, very timely? I mean, I do. Um, you know, there's, just to answer that question that you asked before, in terms mm -hmm. of you know, what this moment um, has done, because, you know, I've spent many, many years in the theater as a, a theater director and then, you know, television and film. And I feel like during this, this, um, the Black Lives Movement, um, uh, it has empowered many people in many fields to take a long, hard, rigorous look um, at what is best practices and, and, and what is not. Um, and I think it has empowered people to say, what I'm experiencing right now is anti-Black. These are white supremacist practices, and this will adversely affect this work and my ability to do this work. And I've used that language, you know, in the last um, few months to people that I don't know I would have, you know, I would have had to play a whole long, soul-crushing, intestine-rotting game. Um, but now I just say what is happening. Um, you know, I, I actually do hold the mirror up to society with my mouth, you know, just saying what is happening. And we all have language now to identify not only the experience that we're having, but the experience that our white colleagues will be having to hear when they hear our experience. You know, we actually have language for every single step of the way um, so that it doesn't just feel like we're having a feeling that is not legitimate. Um, and as you know, as artists, to be able to to to, to name what is happening that is that, that could potentially create really destructive blocks, really powerful. Um, you know, so that's that's just a separate part of of you know, the actual filmmaking. Um, you know, but that 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 has that has been something that I pray does not change, and that just continues to empower us and young filmmakers coming behind us. Um, I, you know, I, I think for me, the thing is that no one else should ever experience what, what we've had to experience it. You know, it, 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 we should all be agents for change. Um, so that's one, that to answer your question, that's one thing. Um, and then in terms of the film, um, you know, getting to, the privilege of getting to spend all this time with Aretha Franklin, her, her legacy, her music, um, her life, you know, her struggles, um, you know, as a, as a woman, it's just, it's been endlessly inspiring because, you know, she was just somebody who let it all hang out. You know, she lived, she lived a rock and roll life, but she also lived, you know, she had a very controlled public persona, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and she, and there's just, there's so many, and her journey, she changed, you know, she, right. um, and it's, it's very liberating um, to, be the kind of, you know, it's, it's intimidating to be the, the kind of vessel for the, you know, for the cinematic, that cinematic journey. But it is also it, on a personal, intimate level, um, liberating to see how much, um, 
how, how much life a, a woman can live um, and how many rules you can break and how, you know, and how, how many, um, how much you can struggle and, and still break free. And I think that we all need um, access to that story. Um, you know, because, because at the end of the day, I believe she healed her self through, with her music, her, with her art. Mm. Um, and you know, that's, that will never stop being a profound story. Yeah. You are bringing tears to my eyes and I, I'm just going to go around and ask each one of you just for perhaps a last word or a last sentence of what you'd like to take from this time into the future. If you could project yourself into 2025, what would be the thing that you would want to bring from today with you? Um, I will take some, I think Alice said it at the top of this, that like this group just feels so organic. The fact that we're all female, but it, it feels right. It doesn't feel like, God, I had to struggle to to find the, the very couple women who had an opportunity to make a film and let's put you all on the panel to talk about the fact that you're women making films. This was about something else and it's also about the craft and it's also about our voice and um, I, I love that so much and this year this year going into it felt really special because there were so many of us making movies and I was excited to see all of it and from all different genres and, and all different sizes of films and in some ways I feel a little cheated and if a week I cheated because this did feel like a watershed year yeah. for female filmmakers on the flip side the fact that we do have streamers where even more people have the opportunity to see our work. I'm just excited about all of us on, uh, on, on this group and, and some yeah. of the other filmmakers that we know that are making films at a high level because that's what it takes when we get this opportunity to just do good work and, and that good work begets um, more open doors for others so that this, this beautiful momentum will just continue. Yeah, may that be so. You guys are all such great role models. I shouldn't say guys, I'm sorry. You all are such great role models for everybody. Anyone else, a last word? And then I have a little treat for you. I just wanted to say it's, um, it's such an honor to be amongst all these women and, and, and their work who I find is so inspiring. And so going into 2025, you know, it's just awesome to get to know more of these women and then continue that relationship and see what they get to make in the future. I can't wait to keep seeing that. Great. Um, I'm gonna just follow Gia and also say like how privileged I feel to be in conversation with the, the women, the humans, the artists on this panel. Um, when you opened and said, we're with these directors, I almost kind of went like, you know, because sometimes I forget, not forget, but it's been such a long journey to get here and to call myself a director. And so if I'm in the company with these artisans, I must be doing something right. But I think the thing that I would take uh, into 2025 is fellowship. Like, mm. honestly, I, I did not go to film school. And so I, you know, a lot of my relationships kind of came from just like hanging around people who loved film, um, but also seeking out people who either looked like me or felt like me. And I honestly don't know that I would have made it through this year if it weren't for, you know, mm -hmm. the advice and, and lift from people like Liesl or Stella Meggy and Terrence Nance, like just like my filmmaking community really were my family in this process. I, there was always someone I could call on um, who had been through something similar. And so fellowship, 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 that I don't know what I would do without it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to second that because while I was shooting, there were many, many times when Stella and Rada and Stephen Cable were, I, I had to text or call and they would, they would be right there. They would always pick up the phone like it was a fire alarm um, because they've all been through it. You know? So that, that sense of community and that support um, it was just, you know, it was life-saving. And that you just want to continue that and you want to provide that for, for other people. Um, but the thing that I would like to go into the future with and I, I, I want for others, um, you know, of us who are, who are just now finding, being given space is um, I would like to take a sense of 
entitlement and ownership into the future because it's something that I never felt. Um, and I want to feel like this is my business and my in industry and I can make any film that I want to make and I'm telling you what it should be. You don't tell me. Love it. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, and I, I, uh, I, in terms of um, what you're talking about, five, I, I think one thing I realized this year is that any five-year plan I make is going to be, like none of it makes any sense. To be honest, I, I don't even know what next month is going to look like. <laughs> so I think I kind of hit this place where I was like, you know, forget it. Like I, I, I'm not, I'm going to drive myself crazy trying to project into the future. Um, but the thing I do know, and maybe even just seeing this panel makes it even more obvious to me is that like, it's so hard to make a film. Like it's just so, takes so much to get any film made that it might as well be one that you really love. And it's the film only you could make. Right. And I think that's what, with all the women here, I think that that's like, or I should say all the directors here, I think that's the thing that you really see in all of their work. Right. And, and I think um, that would be my touchstone is that, you know, in 2025, if I have another film, it better be one that I loved so much that I felt like I had to get made. Otherwise I'm fine with never making another film. <laughs> like I genuinely think if I don't love it, there are plenty of other good filmmakers out there. Right. But I, I know that for me, um, yeah, I think that that's the thing, whatever year it happens. I love that. I'm so proud of you all. I just feel like a little godmama here, just saying, these guys, they, they, it's so great. Um, and as an ending, I'd like to propose an anthem for us. Um, the trailer for Respect just dropped, and I'd like to use it to play us out today. And I think Dave can set that up for us. Thank you all so much. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, thank it's you, Mill really Valley. Good. It was awesome. Awesome. Thank experience. you. albums have you had? Four. And no hits. Honey, find the songs that move you. Until you do that, you ain't going nowhere. R-E-S-P-E-C-T Find out what it means to me R-E-S-P-E-C-T Sing, can't see me Aretha, you do talk, don't you? Not just sing. I'd like you to call me Miss Franklin. To disturb the peace when you can't get no peace. R -E -S -P -E -C -T. Find out what it means to me.